town is entered by Negro units of the 43rd Armored Infantry Battalion. I was a proud man. I was so happy that I was participating in the greatest war in history, but I still couldn't understand this segregation. Oh, beautiful, far heroes proved in liberating strife. Many of us felt we never would get a chance to really fight. Who more than self? Our country loved. And mercy more than life. I couldn't go in, uh, which I didn't realize at that time was because of the color of my skin. America! The story of African Americans in World War II is indeed a legacy of patriotism and valor. In 1941, Americans looked at their world and saw war everywhere. Across the Atlantic, Adolf Hitler's German troops occupied nearly every inch of Europe, from France to Russia, to the Baltic Sea and in North Africa. In the Pacific, the Japanese army and navy had already captured parts of China, Manchuria, Korea, and a number of nearby islands. Pearl Harbor would soon stun the United States into war. Monday morning, the first thing I did, go down to the army recruiting station to enlist in the service of my country. I was told there was no quota of black troops. You've got to remember that uh, this country was very discriminatory, segregated, and there was no change. Uh, first of all, uh, black sailors, as sailors per se, other than as mess attendants or stewards, weren't permitted into the Navy. Well, <clears throat> given the, the fact that I was in the segregated army, uh, that made no difference. I, I joined the army to uh, fight for the country, for my country, because I was born and raised and nurtured by this country. And I saw no reason to slack off because of being segregated or being in a, in a, in a racist society. African Americans' participation in the armed forces was regulated by firmly held beliefs. Blacks should be organized in segregated units. Blacks would not mind segregation. Blacks should be used only in service units. Blacks should not command whites. The motivation was basic. I'm a black man, I was colored then. I felt that if I fought for my country, shed my blood if necessary, when I come back home, I would be treated as equal. I earned it. In a sense, I uh, really believe we fought two wars. One is the war against the Axis and Germans and Japanese and the other is a war against segregation. African Americans would fight, bleed, and die in World War II to free people around the world. Their performance on the battlefield would change the American armed forces forever, and their bravery would pave the way for the modern civil rights movement that would emerge after the war. But one battle would take much longer to win. It would take more than 50 years for America to fully recognize the heroism of its black war fighters. More than 50 years ago, an unspeakable tyranny threatened the world's freedom. And men and women in overwhelming numbers answered the call to arms. Millions of these were Americans, and many of these Americans were black. In the Second World War, more than one million African-American men and women served on land, at sea, and in the air. They served also to ensure that the freedom for which they fought abroad could not be denied at home. The program you're about to see is a chronicle of their service. In no way can it measure up to the determination and patriotism of these extraordinary men and women. 
for the struggle stands as a model of courage and character. As you watch the scenes unfold, you will get a glimpse of a magnificent, heart-rending effort for freedom and justice. Today, the triumphs of these African-American men and women in war and at home are a lasting legacy for every soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman, and merchant marine who served in World War II. But even more, what they gave, what they suffered, and what they accomplished is a shining example to free men and women everywhere. It is very important to note that black Americans have always fought for this country. In the American Revolution, 5,000 fight for freedom. The War of 1812, thousands more serve on land and at sea. The Civil War. African Americans fight for freedom and dignity. The 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiments open up America's western frontier as the Buffalo Soldiers. The 24th and 25th Infantry helped Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders at a crucial moment in the battle for San Juan Hill. Four hundred thousand African Americans served in World War I. Two all-black combat divisions were activated, the 92nd and the 93rd Infantry. But it is under the command of the French Army that black American infantry would prove their mettle on the battlefield. For their bravery, France awards black soldiers its highest medal the Croix de Guerre, and the United States awards black soldiers from both units the Distinguished Service Cross. Despite their bravery, the number of black soldiers in the army are severely reduced during the period between World War I and World War II. In 1940, there were only 4,451 African Americans in the United States Army. Five were commissioned officers and 11 warrant officers. The rest were enlisted men, mostly in service and supply units. There were no black marines and only a few mess stewards in the Navy and Coast Guard. By the mid-1930s, the world veers towards war again. African Americans still must fight for the right to do their part. At West Point, the Army's military academy, the color barrier remains difficult to crack. Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. graduates from West Point in 1936. He is the first African American to graduate from the point in the 20th century. Not one social word was spoken to Davis in his four years at West Point. The Reserve Officer Training Corps, ROTC, allows some African-American college students to become officers. Meanwhile, African-American organizations and newspapers petitioned President Franklin D. Roosevelt and his administration for dignity and equality in the armed forces. There is a grave apprehension among Negroes lest the existing inadequate representation and training of colored persons may lead to the creation of labor battalions and other forms of discrimination against them in the event of war. September 1940, Congress passes the Selective Service and Training Act. The first number is serial number 158. It promises that black Americans will be represented in the armed forces in proportion to the general population. PFC, the CPL, the SGT, the LT, CP, the OD, the MP makes you do cappy. It's a GI man. But the Marine Corps isn't accepting blacks. The Army Air Corps isn't accepting blacks. The Navy is, but only as mess attendants. 
The Army takes African Americans, but only as replacements for its all-black units. On the home front, blacks face discrimination in the expanding defense industry. African American organizations continue to protest. A. Philip Randolph sets a July 1st date for a march on Washington. To stop the march, President Roosevelt offers a compromise. He issues Executive Order 8802, which establishes the President's Committee on Fair Employment Practices. The order promises to end discrimination at factories producing for the national defense. Six months later, the United States enters World War II. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The V for victory becomes the double V for black Americans. Victory over fascism, victory over racism at home. The double V becomes a rallying cry for African American participation in America's armed forces and on the home front. Someday he'll come along. From black entertainers joining the war bond campaign rallies, to farm workers, to workers on the assembly line, African Americans help boost morale and supply America's armed forces. I'll do my best. We did what we did because we were there and we had to do it. You had over 50,000 black soldiers and they were from the port of embarkation you know, where all the goods come in all the way up into the jungles, which is where we were. Early in the war, African-American troops are sent to remote corners of the world to build roads and airstrips for future battles. One of the war's most formidable construction projects is the Lido Road. Running from Lido, Assam in India to Kunming, China, over the Himalayas and through the jungles, the Lido Road will be more than a thousand miles long. We would supply the Gurkhas and the Indians also who were fighting up around Burma where the Japanese were fighting at the time. Uh, we also supplied American supplies and we also supplied the Chinese. Of 15,000 troops who build the road, 60% are African Americans. The 823rd Engineer Aviation Battalion begins work on the road in December 1942. The 849th and the 1883rd Engineer Aviation Battalions and others soon joined them. Freight trains of the Bengal Assam Railroad pull into a transfer shed located near the point of origin of the Lido Road. A detachment of Negro engineers began work on the road in December 1942. In this headquarters area, the Negro units handle every phase of the operations incident to moving vital replacements along the Lido route. On January 12, 1945, the first convoy of soldiers traveled the Lido Road. And when the first convoy from India to China rolled over the completed road, 25 months later, a Negro was driving the lead vehicle. In driving, instead of uh, shifting automatically, you know, double clutching, uh, when you start going up the, the, the mountains, you don't have time to double clutch you know, if you have a loaded truck, so you fly clutch it. So you, you, you slip past the gears, you rough on the truck, but you got to your destination safely. On the other side of the world, African-American troops battle frigid Arctic temperatures and blinding snow to build the Alcan Highway. Well, black soldiers, they, some of them had never drove a bulldozer, had never drove a truck, a big heavy truck, never drove a road grader, but they learned how to use that and did their, their kind of work themselves. We wasn't taught to do none of the kind of work. The uh, terrain was very rough. It was unstable. It would vibrate, which made it rather difficult for the bulldozers. The temperatures varied anywhere from 32 below zero down to 65 below zero. Bulldozers would freeze to the ground. Trucks would freeze to the ground. Once you cut the motor off, you couldn't get any of them started. On the Alaskan Highway, the black troops were housed in pyramidal cloth tents, 
while the white soldiers were in Mason huts and um, housing some of the army bases. What protected the black soldiers uh, inside of the tents, the cross was about an inch thick, which acted as insulation. From April 1942 until July 1943, black soldiers work on the 1600 mile highway that will link Alaska, Canada, and the United States to supply Allied forces. It was a great accomplishment. It's a great feat, and some compared with uh, building the Panama Canal. Planes for Russia at Fairbanks, Alaska. The first Russia-bound planes Through the Lend-Lease program, the United States got 8,000 planes to Russia by way of Alaskan Highway. African-American soldiers also build airfields that pave the way for the liberation of Europe. Hard work, sweat, and tears. And, 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 and the thing was this, you don't go home until you finish this line. If you get it finished, then you go home. The Tuskegee experiment was designed to fail. I was not going to fail. The officer in charge told me, he said, well, we don't have any colored in the military, Army Air Corps. There are other places for you, and we will not have any. The basis for their refusal was a staff report which had determined, I uh, use that word euphemistically, that uh, Colored troops did not have the capability, the intelligence, the courage, or even the coordination to fly fighter aircraft. There were a couple of, uh, of young black men in the Chicago area who felt so strongly about wanting to fly military aircraft that they rented an old Lincoln Page biplane and flew it to Washington to focus on the fact that blacks did not have opportunities to learn to fly military aircraft. They were met by then Senator Harry Truman. His statement, if you guys have the guts enough to fly that thing all the way from Chicago to Washington, then I have guts enough to see that you get what you're asking for. Mrs. Roosevelt went down to Tuskegee on a visit, and while she was there, she went out to Moton Field and she met Chief Anderson, who was the chief pilot of the primary phase of, uh, of, of flying. And uh, she went to the dismay of the Secret Service and everybody, she went for a ride with Chief Anderson. And when she went back to Washington, within a short time, the Tuskegee experiment was uh, begun. The War Department announces plans for the formation and training of an all-black pursuit squadron. An airfield to train the pilots is built in Tuskegee, Alabama. The first class consisted of uh, 13, 12 students and one military officer who was then Captain Davis who later uh, became the commander. I was transferred from the base at Tuskegee Army Airfield to command the 99th in August of 42. We were very much interested in flying. I think that everybody felt that this was an opportunity because they'd not had the advantage of such training before. We had come to the realization that, uh, that it would not come easy, that we would have to be almost twice as good as the other people if we were to succeed, but admonished ourselves and admonished our, our comrades that this was not only for us, but it was for our whole race of people. In April 1943, the 99th Flight Pursuit Squadron leaves for North Africa. Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. is in command. He has no combat experience. The 99th is stationed at Cape Bon, attached to the 33rd Fighter Group. Trained for pursuit, the 99th ironically flies bombing and strafing missions in North Africa and Sicily through the summer of 1943. And they had great problems in 1943 because the commander of the 33rd group was an avowed segregationist and he did everything he could to keep the unit segregated. They were on a different part of the airfield. They weren't invited to join the officers club on his part of the airfield. 
they were kept segregated in every way, shape, or form. Probably the worst thing that the commander did to them is that in their first combat missions, he didn't allow a veteran pilot to lead them into combat. In September 1943, the lack of significant fighter engagements endangers the 99th's continued existence. Davis is ordered back to the States to defend the 99th's record. General Davis, then Lieutenant Colonel Davis, had to fight very hard to keep the unit flying. The Air Force recommendation, the Army Air Corps recommendation, was to abandon the 99th and to stop the training of the 332nd, which is in training at Selfridge Army Airfield at that time. Lieutenant Colonel Davis's defense keeps the Tuskegee Airmen flying. With huge losses mounting for the 15th Air Force, the 332nd Fighter Group moved to Ramatelli, Italy in April 1944 to begin bomber escort duty. Davis snapped at the opportunity. He had been flying a very obsolete airplane, the P-39 Air Cobra. He was given initially the P-47 for about a month, and then the P-51. Just about every day we were flying top cover for bombers, protecting the bombers from enemy fighters. Now the bombers, they have to fly straight and level at a certain speed so that the bombardier can make sure that the bombs fall where they're supposed to. We flew around all the smoke to pick them up at the other end. And it's a sad commentary when you see those guys coming in there flying like bugs and you can see them explode. On mission after mission, bomber crews look to the 332nd's red tail fighter escort for protection. You would stay with the bombers because that was your primary job. Because when the fighters went running off chasing other fighters, fighting German fighters, then new German fighters would come in and there the bombers would be all by themselves. The uh, 332nd never lost a bomber to an enemy fighter in 200 missions stretching from May of 44 to April of 45. That is a unique record. No white unit and all the rest of them were white that stayed in the hunt as long as they did would make that claim. One of the Army's best kept secrets was that there was a black fighter group. We had no idea that the Red Tails, who had given us the finest escort and the, whose escort we preferred, were black pilots. Not an idea in the world. The Tuskegee Airmen were a bunch of very courageous, able, intelligent, aggressive young African-Americans who were not going to be stopped by anything and we were some damn good pilots. There was just a feeling of patriotism and a feeling that everyone wanted to help out in the war effort. African-American women also answered the call to service. From Europe to North Africa to New Guinea and here at home, they serve and work to win the war. In April 1941, the Army Nurse Corps has 48 African-American nurses. By 1944, there will be 220 black Army nurses. African-American females in the Women's Army Corps, or WACs, also have an uphill battle to serve their country. Charity Adams commanded the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion. The uh, white wax had been serving overseas for almost two years by this time, but for some reason the usual black troops may make sold may make trouble or blacks can't do what others are doing and whatnot. Uh, uh, overseas commanders did not want black women to come over. I guess if there is anything that I remember about the Second World War, it was the fact or that I was a member of the Six Triple Eight. Central Postal Directory. It was the first and the only battalion of black women to serve overseas during the Second World War. And I'm very, very proud of that. Stationed in Birmingham, England, and later Rouen, France, the 6888 processes mail, forwarding eagerly awaited packages and letters to Americans throughout Europe. Their job was redirecting mail that it had one attempted delivery based on the last address the people back home had. But of course in war times you move pretty fast. Our job was not exciting, but it was necessary because it was necessary for the morale of the troops. Mail meant morale. By the war's end, 
the Navy had commissioned six black female officers and had enlisted 70 waves. The Coast Guard by this time had accepted a few black women in its reserve program, the SPARS. For civilian African-American women, World War II brings new challenges and opportunities. 600,000 out of a million African-Americans who enter paid employment during the war are women. Picatinny Arsenal at Dover, New Jersey needed more workers to make more ammunition for our fighting forces. The appeal was to Harlem. A former factory worker sums it up best when she declares, Lincoln may have freed the slaves, but Hitler was the one that got us out of the white folks' kitchen. This young white fellow said, you black SOB, I'd heard they had commissioned you guys, but I never thought I'd see one. So I was standing down on the corner of 14th and Independence Avenue, all dressed up in my blues, and I never got so many hate stares in my life. From white servicemen who looked at me as well said, who does he think he is? The Navy resists taking blacks, except as stewards. The Marine Corps remains all white. In 1942, the need for manpower cracks the Navy's and Marine Corps' color line. The Secretary of the Navy said that uh, black folks couldn't handle the modern arms of warfare that, uh, that they had in the Marine Corps, and that was a challenge to me, and that's why I went in. In June 1942, the U.S. Marine Corps enlists blacks. From across the country, African-American recruits arrive at Munford Point for boot camp. For many of them, Munford Point, like other southern bases, is a rude awakening. How in the world did I ever get into something like this? Our receptionist said, you will say yes, sir, no, sir, and you will not move until you are told to do so. Do you understand, boy? I heard what uh, happened to uh, black people or colored people, as we were called it, uh, south of the Mason-Dixie line, but I had no personal real experience, and my parents, who were Southerners, basically uh, never talked about it. Colonel Samuel A. Woods, Munford Point's commanding officer, is sympathetic to the challenges faced by his recruits. Colonel Wood, who, as you know, was a graduate of the Citadel, was, in my opinion, the fairest white man I've ever met or seen. Almost weekly, he would have us write a letter to Washington in which he was complaining about the way we were treated as human men in North Carolina. We did all the things that all Marines do, close order drill, find a rifle range, hand-to-hand -hand combat, using maps, the survival training, anything that any other Marine got. In the Navy, the number of black enlistees approaches 100,000 and the Navy establishes its first training program for black naval officers. I didn't know why I was going to be sent there and didn't actually find out why because we had sealed orders until we got there and met 15 other young black men to discover that we were the guinea pigs to either prove or disprove the myth that blacks were not capable of serving as officers in the United States Navy. They later became known as the Golden 13. The Navy trains the black cadets within a segregated area at Great Lakes Training Station in Illinois. We try to study together, work together. Well, certainly we're trying to be better than the next guy, and I think everybody was very competitive. It was very cooperative and yet competitive. By, by doing that, I think we but it's our own level of accomplishment. Black sailors who were in training uh, came there with a purpose, and that purpose was to make sure that people knew that they could sail, that they were qualified to be sailors. The majority of them, I would say 95% of those guys, uh, would have been able to have sailed any place. The Navy's USS Mason and the PC-1264, with their predominantly African-American crews, escort and protect vessels during the war years. Pioneering African-American officers and enlisted men also serve in the Coast Guard and Merchant Marine while protecting our shores and delivering men and material of war 
to battlefields around the world. Afro-Americans knew nothing about airborne because it's a very elite service. It was restricted then only to whites. But here we're now going to be the only all-black parachute unit in world history, black from top to bottom. The 555th Parachute Company, the Triple Nichols, an all-black unit is activated at Fort Benning, Georgia. These paratroopers achieve a remarkable record, not a single refusal to jump. With unit morale high, the Triple Nichols expect to see combat. You remember that the Battle of the Balls had done great damage to our force in Europe, and they were looking for a specialized unit to join 82nd and more division in some form. We spent four weeks in individualized training, jumping every single week, both day and night operations. Instead, they are stationed in Pendleton, Oregon, to join Operation Firefly, a mission to protect the West Coast from Japanese balloon-borne biological weapons and incendiary devices designed to start forest fires. Kept from combat during World War II, the Triple Nickels nevertheless prove their ability to perform the task. Their success lays the groundwork for later integration of African Americans into the highly skilled 82nd Airborne Infantry Division. It was one big noisy mess. Spring 1944. Allied forces gather in England for the largest amphibious invasion in history. African American troops are part of the operation that will liberate Europe. Quartermaster units rush troops to the docks and load precious supplies. Their support is critical to the pending invasion. June 6, 1944. Normandy, France. D-Day. The invasion begins. My job was to clean the mines so that the infantry coming aboard wouldn't get caught into the, wouldn't find themselves in the middle of any personnel mines. At Omaha Beach, black soldiers of the 320th Anti-Aircraft Balloon Battalion release barrage balloons to protect the Allied troops and ships. African-American medics tend to the men wounded in the bloody battle. The number of casualties on Omaha Beach was phenomenal. We had never seen that many or even thought that there would be that many casualties. I helped along with other medics to dress and to uh, uh, do the best we could with the wounded. Port companies arrive in Normandy. They work 30, 40, 50 hour shifts, building docks and unloading supplies that will sustain the Allied push toward Germany. General George Patton's Third Army breaks out from the Normandy beachhead. To supply Patton's troops in their dash across France, the Transportation Corps establishes the Red Ball Express. Nearly 70% of the soldiers who man this massive effort are African American. The 469th Quartermaster Unit is in charge of 30 truck companies. They deliver food, ammunition, and fuel to the troops, and transport prisoners and casualties to the rear area. These unsung heroes of the road live up to their motto. Keep them rolling, keep them supplied, keep them smiling. During World War II, the Red Ball, they, they constantly was going all the time. No stopping. Always on call, any time of day or night. The Red Ball Express carries 8,000 tons a day for four months. From August to November, they will haul more than 400,000 tons of supplies. By the end of 1944, nearly 480,000 African Americans are serving overseas. In World War II, the African American experience, at times, it was not nice. 
I was quite frustrated with what was going on. We had to keep our thoughts and our minds on the big picture instead of worrying about segregation. The regiment really was not as well equipped and as well trained as it should have been. The 92nd Division was named for the Buffalo Soldiers of the 9th and 10th Cavalry. The 92nd Infantry Division is reactivated in 1942. Only 20 years after they had carried their battle flag into World War I, the proud 92nd would fight racism in training and on the battlefield. We were victims of uh, being sent to locations where Negroes couldn't do any harm to cities they were stationed near. Segregationist army policies and white citizen protests make it difficult to find places to station all black units. With the all black 93rd Infantry Division stationed at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, no other single post is available for the 92nd. When the 93rd ships out to the Pacific in 1943, Fort Huachuca opens for the 92nd. White commanders of black units were southern selected officers. And I found personally, and other black men found personally, that men who were generally not from the south were more considerate toward us, more respectful toward us. And uh, we, we enjoyed serving under them more so than from uh, under the uh, white southern officers. Well, the general free feeling of the white leadership in the units that I was in, that my, this is, I'm, I'm speaking of my own self personally, that uh, they didn't think very much of us. They didn't think we had the intelligence to uh, even pull the trigger and shoot straight. Army practice kept white officers from serving in units where they were junior in rank to any black officer. This created tensions in the 92nd. This practice limited the use of black officers and more importantly, restricted their rank. I was angry. It made me feel very, very angry. Uh, the fact that uh, my intelligence was insulted every time that I would uh, make a suggestion uh, on, on a tactic. The black officers were never given any latitude on, on in any command situation at all. I was downgraded because I was black. The 92nd is commanded by Southerner Major General Edward M. Allman. It is in a climate of racial mistrust that the 92nd trained for combat. Brigadier General Benjamin O. Davis Sr. on an inspection tour noted that Major General Allman had overlooked the human element in training with no thought to establishing racial understanding. My combat team was one of three combat teams in the 92nd Infantry Division. We were informed after maneuvers by the division commander that the 3 7th Infantry Combat Team would prepare for overseas movement. We were going overseas, so we were just going overseas. And we, we didn't know where we were going. We went into combat with the 5th Army, who Mark Clark commanded. We were attached to the 1st Armored Division. The 370th Infantry and the 598th Field Artillery made combat ready with the best soldiers from the division deployed to Italy. They joined Allied forces fighting along the Gothic Line, stretching from north of Massa eastward to Bologna. The 92nd's 370th combat team fights aggressively and maintains contact with Axis forces. After six weeks of Allied success, the Axis forces withdraw into the Rommel-designed Gothic line. The German soldiers in Italy were seasoned soldiers. They had come from another front. Namely, I think most of them came from southern France. They knew what they were doing. When you ran up against uh, a, a bunch of them, you, you knew you were in a fight. The rest of the division arrives in late October and November and goes into the line. Two point four inches of rain in 24 hours ending 9th December 
flood a regimental bivouac area of the 92nd Division at a point 17 airline mile south of Bologna. A field artillery battalion improvises a ferry to carry ammunition to a stranded battery across the swollen stream. The casualties experienced by the 92nd have a devastating effect on unit combat effectiveness. Black replacements are sent into theater with little or no combat training. Many cannot read or write. They are ill-prepared for combat. The morale of the black soldiers, the uh, enlisted personnel in the, in the 370th at the time that I joined them was very low. Most of these soldiers there were, were draftees. They didn't want to be there. And when they got there, they were treated very badly. They weren't treated like human beings. Despite the handicaps, many units of the 92nd distinguished themselves in battle. Operating in the Sergio Valley, the 365th and the 366th Infantry, supported by the 597th Field Artillery, are particularly effective, seizing ground from German and Italian units and beating back numerous counterattacks. From fall 1944 to spring 1945, the 92nd helps to hold the Gotham Line, but the entire 5th Army remains stalled. Elsewhere on the Italian front, continued heavy rains, floods, and high winds make Allied offensive operations virtually impossible. Reports from the front say it's impossible to exaggerate the harshness of this year's Italian winter. In April, the 5th Army begins its final drive through the Gothic Line. There have been changes. The 92nd is reorganized as an integrated force. Attached are the famed Japanese-American 442nd and the white 473rd Infantry, along with the black 370th. They roll up the western Italian coast, liberating the ports of Massa and Genoa. Many African-Americans distinguish themselves in the Italian campaign, but receive little recognition. There was a definite program afoot to suppress acts of bravery or acts of heroism on, on the part of the black soldiers. I never heard any stories or any comments concerning bra uh, bravery by black soldiers from any of the white officers. And every time we turn around, we ever hear, hear about acts of bravery of the white soldiers. For the 92nd, World War II ends on April 30th, 1945, when German and Italian troops they had fought since August surrender. Most of them were excited. They felt as though they were going to get a chance to see some action. Under the leadership of General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz, Allied forces undertook the island hopping campaign that led to the Japanese homeland. Black troops are in the thick of the ferocious fighting. The first African-American unit to engage the enemy in ground combat was the 1st Battalion of the 24th Infantry, fighting on Bougainville. Black Marine depot companies are employed to serve alongside white Marine assault units in what was to become some of the most desperate and heroic fighting of the war. A depot company was a more or less like a utility company. So a utility company could be used in any capacity, even in frontline combat, because when the Marines went on, on Tarawa, something like a thousand people got killed in three days fight. I think they lost approximately 4,000 on Iwo Jima. They lost thousands on Okinawa. When you're on that beachhead and they're dropping those mortars and artillery shelves on you, that's, that's about as much frontline combat as you can get in. Marine ammunition companies are on the beach in the invasion of the Marianas, carrying ammo to the front lines and building supply dumps. African-American Seabees perform much-needed construction projects on the far-flung islands of the Pacific, including Guadalcanal, New Caledonia, and New Georgia. The invasion of Iwo Jima depends on the ducks, the amphibious vehicles manned by African-American army operators. They bring 
105 millimeter howitzers ashore. I came off there with my amphibious duck loaded with a 105 Hauser and seven Marines on the radio harm, but don't come in on red beach, it was too hot to come in on green. The water was real rough because, you know, you, you got to have training to know how to drive that duck on when the water is rough and your ramp is coming up and down. Well, I tell you, I was scared going in and I was scared coming back. All that fall over top and you don't know what's going to hit you. On shore, black marines face a nightmare of enemy fire with the invasion force. I hit Iwo Jima with the 34th Marine Depot Company about D plus three. Now, this was the night of D plus three. And they put me and a few other black marines up to hold that line. Well, it was kind of scary. Uh, of course, I wasn't afraid because perhaps I didn't have sense enough to be afraid. I always felt that uh, anything horrible happening would happen to somebody else, not me. As it grew on and got darker, I realized that I was up on that line by myself. There being no light so you can see, all around me I could hear Japanese talking. You knew that the enemy was out there and uh, you wonder whether or not you'd be able to get into the uh, beach safely or whether or not uh, perhaps you'd have problems getting in. The intensity of the fire uh, on such a small area as that, one could have been killed at any one time, at any one place. Black sailors would also set a standard for valor in the Pacific. Aboard the battleship West Virginia at Pearl Harbor, Navy messman Dory Miller mans an anti-aircraft gun and engages attacking Japanese planes. Miller will go down with his ship, the Liscombe Bay, later in the war. Another messman, Alonzo Swan, shoots down kamikaze planes diving toward his ship, the USS Intrepid. In all, Four black sailors are awarded the Navy's second highest honor, the Navy Cross. Swan will wait 50 years to receive his medal. The legacy of Swan and Miller is continued during the invasion of Okinawa as black naval gunners help destroy the horde of attacking kamikaze planes intent on destroying the fleet. The Japanese sent suicide planes to land on Okinawa. We saw Japanese planes diving into the, trying to dive into the ship. The Navy gunners blew them up in midair. The most pride, I think, is uh, having put your life on your line for your country. The feel of it was that you would have lost your life for a good reason, a good purpose. I am proud to have been a Marine, and you'll find most black Marines think the same way that I do. If this country ever went to war, I wanted to be a definite part of that war. Word came out that they wanted volunteers, uh, colored troops they call us in, uh, to volunteer to fight in white units as an integrated unit. I was told it would be integrated. We got ridiculed quite a bit by a lot of combat troops that came over. We went overseas earlier in the war to, to help build the airports and so forth for the 8th and 9th Air Forces. And after they got there, we were constantly ridiculed as, you know, as, as they ridiculed blacks at that time. I liked the action. That outfit didn't have enough action for me. I was in the Army and I wanted to see some action. By December 1944, the Army faces a dangerous shortage. Few white combat replacement troops are left in the European theater. When the Germans launch a counter-offensive in the Ardennes, the need for reinforcements becomes crucial. There is only one place to turn, the all-black support units behind the lines. For the first time in the war, the Army asks African-American soldiers to take their places in combat units with white soldiers. 
The response exceeds all expectations. The sergeant came up and said, anybody want to sign up for the infantry? I didn't hear no more about it until the next day I went to town and I came back, the medical officer was there examining people, you know, for the infantry. And all those were passed. I think the next day they were gone. Almost 5,000 black soldiers volunteer. They know they are trading the safety of duty in the rear to risk their lives on the front lines. When we volunteered to go into combat, uh, we automatically had to give up any rank that we had. We had to go in as privates. Oh, I was, I was generous. I give them my stripes. <laughs> I went from Buck Sergeant to Buck Private to, for a chance to get shot at. I was just boiling for a fight. I'll be frank with you. I was boiling and stewing for a fight anyhow. It didn't make any difference to me who I fought. To limit the effects of personnel losses in service units, only 2,500 black soldiers are taken. In January, they begin infantry training. They sent troops who had been wounded and couldn't go back to their unit, infantry type sergeants, to train us. We received the best training anyone could receive to prepare to go into combat. Six weeks later, 53 platoons of black infantrymen, led by white lieutenants and platoon sergeants, joined white infantry and armored units at the front. They told us we were integrated. Turned out we were not totally integrated. We became an extra platoon. We got up there. The white soldiers were glad to see us from the beginning. I think they were glad to see anybody come up there because they was catching hell. We got right in there in the thick of things, and they, they taught, us, taught us a whole lot right quick. Our first initial firefight was interesting. The colonel came up, and we had to take this little town. And the colonel said, well, we might as well try them. All of a sudden, everything break loose. So everybody started scattering out. So we ran to this building, and the Germans, they were tearing us up. And the lieutenant went and said, you know, call back for some smoke so we can withdraw. And so I told the lieutenant, I said, lieutenant, I said, we done came this far. What are we going to go back now for? And we took the town. We, we, after that, it was trying us constantly <laughs> because they knew we could do the job. I was pretty scared. I really tried to hold myself macho together, but I was really sorry that I volunteered. Uh, I, I really didn't feel good about it at all, uh, volunteering for this, this hideous duty. If you've never really been on an artillery fire in an air bomb, you don't understand it. We were on a heavy artillery fire. And I was so frightened that I grabbed my steel helmet and pulled it down to my feet. Now, this sounds stupid. <laughs> I know you can't do that, but that is what fear will do to you. The Army calls the platoons an experiment in integration. The relationship between the black and the white soldiers was very good. It was excellent. They are more like family. Anytime anybody knows you're in combat, you're a family man. When the war in Europe is over, the theater commander tells the black infantrymen that integration is over. Some return home. Others go back to segregated units. All of a sudden, one morning, they came up with a truck and picked us up with black soldiers up and carried us on back down into France and assigned us to a black outfit. And I felt rather badly in there. Uh, I said, you need to tell me this is what's happening to us after the war is over, they're getting rid of us. The experiment shatters the belief that integrating combat units will cause social dissension. We proved to the world that we could fight, and it had already been proven by the 9th and 10th Cavalry, we proved that as Americans we could fight. In fact, we overdid the job, because in, Viet in World War II, the black newspapers were saying, let our boys fight. In Vietnam, they said, let our boys stop fighting, because they recognized the fact that combat kills people. And we were ready for combat, and we were warriors. True sense of the word. Anytime they had a tough position to be cracked, they would send for the 761st. We continued and completed 183 days straight of combat duty, and the only reason why we didn't do more is because the Germans quit. The 761st Tank Battalion is activated on April 1st, 1942. I went to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. And I'm not bragging about that place because it is about the worst that they had in the United States. 
But that was where the 761st was located. You learned every job. There was a learn to be a driver, a bow gunner, a loader, and a gunner, and a tank commander. They were going to make that unit look good. No matter what happened, they were going to show people that blacks could fight tanks and fight against the Germans as well as the whites could. And in the long run, they did a beautiful job of that. October 10, 1944. The 761st lands at Omaha Beach. They are the Army's first African-American tank battalion committed to combat. They have been sent to help fight the Germans' elite tank corps. The General Patton had made the statement that they didn't have to worry about Negroes pulling with tanks because it was too technical pieces in equipment. And yet, when he requested from the Department of Army to send him the best remaining separate tank battalion left in the United States, who should show up but the 761st? And we went to a little plant not too far from Nancy, and that's where we all uh, assembled. And then we got visited by General Patton. And he told us that, you know who he was? And he says, I have nothing but the best, and I sent for you. And he says, don't let me down, and don't let your people down. We were pinned down, burned down in these tanks. The first battle on Chateau Vaux and Chateau Saline. And we had a hell of a battle there. And we took no cities. We took those three cities the first day. And we unbuttoned, came out, and they almost fell off the feet to see that we were black. Through November, the 761st battles its way through Jusse, Mauvais-le-Vic, and Goubling. This unit had an exceptional record in combat. December 1944, the Battle of the Bulge. At Bastogne, surrounded by Germans, the 101st Airborne fights for survival. To relieve the 101st, Patton rushes elements of his 3rd Army north. Serving in support, the 761st blasts its way from the Saar River on December 24th, north to Neuf Chateau, Belgium, where they arrive on the 30th. We were truly nervous in Bastogne because behind every tree there was a dead soldier enemy or yours. There were groups of American GIs massacred by the Kampfgruppe Piper. Eleven black soldiers from the 333rd Field Artillery Battalion. When the bodies were recovered and it was discovered that they had been mutilated, uh, they had bashed some of their skulls in with rifle butts, uh, gouged their eyes out with bayonet. We never fought as one, but one unit all together. They just split us all over the place. And I think that even confused the Germans because I guess when they, everywhere they looked, they saw a black tank and I guess they thought it was a whole bunch of us. But only was about 700 of us, see? But they, they, they didn't know that. We had the speed and the 360 degree traversing of the turrets, which uh, the German tanks, they had to turn the whole tank to operate or fire on you. We could be traveling across 30, 35 miles an hour and that turret was revolving 360 degrees where you just keep firing as you go. And that's just how we were able to either outflank them or get into a whole defilade position and knock them out. After the Battle of the Bulge, units of the 761st go on to fight in Belgium at Bonnaroo, Raisonne, Tillé, and Pirompi. In Luxembourg, at Steinbach, in Highland at Jabek, and and Erling. On March 3rd, the 761st Tank Battalion enters Germany. They reconstituted a task force and called it Task Force Rhine, and we tankers were given command of the operation. This was the outstanding and one total operation involving all of the battalion, and we broke a hole through the Maginot Line, through the Siegfried Line, into the Rhine Plain, an entire armored division of the 7th Army poured through that hole and went all the way to the Rhine with no opposition whatsoever. My men were magnificent. The 761st captures 3,000 enemy troops and expends 50 tons of ammunition during Task Force Rhine operations. 
attached again to Third Army, the 761st spearheads Patton's drive through Germany to Austria. What used to surprise me, I wondered why didn't you pass all of these tanks pull over to the side, a division, and here come the 761st, beat up, tired, tank battalion to go in and uh, lead the way. On their journey through Germany, the 761st witnessed the horrors of war. 761st was uh, assigned to the 71st Infantry Division at the time that this division uh, liberated the camp near Wells, Austria. The name of the camp was Gunschkerken Lager, and it was one of the smaller refugee camps or concentration camps. The 761st meets the Soviet Union's first Ukrainian front on May 6th at the Inns River. Now my husband has had lots of troops since then, but whenever he talks of soldiers, whenever he talks of fine soldiers, of good soldiers, he talks about his soldiers who are the men of the 761st. We had a chance to prove that the black man could be a good warrior. Well, the impact of awarding me the Medal of Honor, uh, in, in, to my thinking, is that uh, somebody wants to salve their conscience. It should have been done at the time that, that these awards were made, the Distinguished Service Cross, uh, at the time the men did these heroic acts. Uh, but it's, it was a time of complication. Uh, it was a time of trouble between the races. Uh, we were a very different society in that time. For more than 50 years following World War II, no African Americans are awarded the Medal of Honor for actions performed during the war. The Medal of Honor is very specific. You don't have to just be brave. You've got to do it above and beyond the call of duty. All hell broke loose. <laughs> we were just trying to keep them from uh coming down here further, and that's where we had a young lieutenant by the name of John Fox, who was up on Simon Kalina. He was our forward observer, and he asked for fire, our own fire, on him to stop the Germans that were coming down. Well, it ought to make the country look a little more closely at what was done by the black soldiers, what was done to the black soldiers, uh, it ought to shed some light in a dark corner of our closet. Sergeant Reuben Rivers, he was uh, the um, point man for Company A. He led the way coming into Dublin. His tank hit a landmine and it split his leg from his knee cap all the way up his leg. The medics, they said, man, this is a million dollar wound. So that meant you can go back home, you're out of the war, it's over for you. And he said, no, he said, they need me here. And the next day, when we had to move out, and Captain William P. gave us an order, said, be careful when you go over this hill. And as we were doing this, my tank commander, Westerson, they told him, back out, rivers, back out, back out, back out, tigers are down there, don't you see them? He said, yes, I see them, but I'm going to engage them. And he did, by that time, a big white flash, hit up by the uh, tank commander side and he got killed. It's very important that it be done now while their comrades, the guys who fought alongside them in World War II are still alive because the honor and the glory of it reflects on all of them. The Company C was given a mission to break through the German lines to get to an objective called Castle at Nalfi. We broke through and when we broke through they didn't, uh, the Germans did not know we were there. During the uh, action of breaking through the lines, we neutralized three machine gun nests, a couple of dugouts. Uh, we cut numerous communication lines. In May 1996, the Pentagon forwards the names of seven soldiers to the White House, recommending them for the Medal of Honor for their heroic actions in World War II. There were a million two hundred thousand black Americans in uniform in World War II, and this is an important symbolic act. But I don't think there's any way at this in this day and time that you can adequately recognize all that they contributed 
and all that was denied them in terms of medals and honors and promotions, these sort of things, uh, there's, there's no way that you can balance the books entirely at this remove. We're half a century down the road. All you can do is this symbolic act and give to them some glory, some honor. Uh, they earned that, and, and it's long overdue. If you serve your country, you deserve to be served. It, it really makes me feel sad that we, we did our job and fought, but we weren't appreciated. The African-American veterans of World War II served a nation that was not yet ready to serve them. With their double V symbol, they fought against both fascism and racism. They were determined to prove to their fellow Americans that they were their equals on the battlefield and were entitled to be their equals at home. We should all be proud of the sacrifices they made on the snow-covered fields of Belgium, in the skies over Europe, and on the bloody beaches of Iwo Jima. They wrote a noble chapter in American military history. Their legacy made my rise in the military possible. I stood on their shoulders. They made America a better place for all of us. They asked for no special recognition. They asked for no tribute. They just wanted to fight for their beloved country, and they did. We owe them our thanks. We must continue to carry on their legacy of commitment and courage. First Lieutenant Vernon Baker, 92nd Infantry Division. First Lieutenant John Fox, 92nd Infantry Division. First Lieutenant Charles L. Thomas, 614th Tank Destroyer Battalion. Staff Sergeant Edward A. Carter, 12th Armored Division. Staff Sergeant Reuben Rivers, 761st Tank Battalion. Private First Class Willie F. James, Jr., 104th Infantry Division. Private George Watson, 29th Quartermaster. Now and forever, the truth will be known about these African Americans who gave so much that the rest of us might be free. My purple mountain, majesty. Yes, it is. 